Over 50 years ago, the Airbus A300 completed its first revenue flight with launch customer Air France. In retrospect, the type would become one of the most influential wide-body aircraft in history. That's because when the A300 came along, it was the first twin-jet wide-body commercial plane on the market, and it gave airlines an aircraft that could fly on long-haul high-capacity routes with lower operating costs than the three- and four-engined alternatives, such as the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 or Boeing 747. When the A300 first flew with Air France, its success under the French carrier attracted a host of airlines eager to benefit from its favourable economics and route versatility. We take a closer look at the Airbus A300, its development and its influence on the aviation industry for today's video. After entering service, the A300 would remain in production for almost four decades, and it proved to be the plane that launched Airbus as one of the world's main commercial aircraft manufacturers. There were over 550 A300s built over its production run, and the twinjet is still commonly found today as a freighter, and in rare cases, a passenger jet. During the A300's development, there were already proven and popular wide-body aircraft on the market particularly the Boeing 747 and McDonnell Douglas DC-10, which offered high-capacity, long-range capabilities ideal for long-haul networks. While these aforementioned aircraft were excellent for their market, they were more expensive to operate and typically needed to be flown on lengthy routes and with high load factors to be profitable. The A300 set out to offer an alternative. The type came about as the result of a joint agreement between the governments of France, West Germany and the UK. As accurately predicted, airlines had demand for wide-body aircraft on shorter segments for which fuel-guzzling planes like the 747 would not be economical to operate. Thus, the idea of creating a 300-seater, two-engined jet suited to the medium-haul market became the focus, and its development would eventually lead to the origins of Airbus itself as a company. As stated by Airbus, the A300, quote, marked the beginning of a new era for air transport with increased passenger capacities and unrivaled operational efficiency. Air France became the first official customer for the A300 with a commitment for six airframes placed in 1970, four years before the plane would debut in passenger service, and German carrier Lufthansa would follow suit. So why was the A300 more appealing? Well, flying with two engines greatly improved its operating economics, making it a viable option on medium-haul networks where the 747 was not suited, but smaller aircraft lacked capacity. Not only this, but having just two engines led to savings with maintenance, further widening profit margins for operators. Owing to its advanced avionics, the aircraft would become the first wide-body certified for two crew operations which further reduced operating costs. As such, the A300 could deliver a far lower cost per seat than the trijets of its day. Compared to a single-aisle jet, the A300 also offered sizable cargo space in the hold, allowing operators to earn further revenue per flight by hauling additional belly freight. Air passengers had become used to enjoying the comfort of contemporary wide bodies, most notably the Boeing 747, but this was typically reserved for long-haul routes. As with any new airliner taking to the skies, there can be some degree of caution before carriers decide to commit to major purchases. This was even more the case many decades ago as manufacturers experimented with novel technologies or concepts, in this case, a twin-jet wide body using composite materials. Airbus was also a newcomer to the industry and didn't have the tried and tested name of manufacturing giants like Boeing, Lockheed and McDonnell Douglas. Initially, home carriers Air France and Lufthansa made up the bulk of orders as early sales of the jet proved disappointing. Given Airbus's French and German routes and how much had been invested into the project, we can imagine the political pressure to make the A300 a success. Korean Air would become the first non-European airline to order the jet, and other carriers followed suit. One key victory for Airbus would be its deal with Eastern Airlines. The American carrier was looking for a new fuel-efficient jet that could replace the capacity of its DC-9s and 727s. As retold by the website Yesterday's Airlines, 
Airbus's new offering was too big for Eastern, but Airbus was willing to compromise and effectively agreed to charge Eastern for the 170-seater they wanted, rather than the 250-seater they would get in the form of the A300. Eastern wanted to test out the A300s for six months at no charge, and Airbus, desperate to enter the US market, agreed. The airline was rather pleased with its A300 experience and ordered 23 aircraft. This agreement, along with the one forged with Pan Am, introduced the A300 and A310 to American Airlines and passengers and were considered by Airbus to be pivotal moments that solidified the plane maker's presence in the competitive North American market. By the end of the 1970s, the A300 had attracted over 200 firm orders and there were already over 100 aircraft in service at over a dozen airlines. This period would be the peak for A300 deliveries, with the program's best year, in terms of deliveries, taking place in 1982, when it delivered 46 aircraft. By this point, the plane maker was in the process of certifying its upcoming Airbus A310 jet, a shortened derivative of the A300. The A310 would end up eclipsing the A300 in deliveries most years after its debut in 1983. However, by the 1990s, orders for the A310 had dried up and Airbus made just nine deliveries in the program's final five years. On the contrary, the A300 would continue to attract sales into the new millennia, with Airbus maintaining a consistent rate of deliveries until the final airframe was handed off in 2007. While the family would prove more popular as a freighter by this point, it nonetheless gave Airbus a steady stream of revenue and allowed the A300's production run to last an impressive 37 years. In the same year the A310 made its passenger service debut, Airbus was conducting the maiden flight for its latest variant in the A300 family, the A300-600. With a slightly stretched fuselage, the Dash 600 offered several key enhancements that would ultimately make it the most popular variant in the A300 family by some distance. The A300-600 was initially equipped with Pratt & Whitney JT9D, but would later be built with Pratt & Whitney PW4100 series or General Electric CF6 engines. Airbus then upgraded the jet with a longer-range variant called the A300-600R, which would replace the base variant. In all, Airbus built over 300 of the Dash 600, which outsold the A310 by more than 50 aircraft. The A300 introduced many things that became a blueprint for future aircraft, particularly its use of two engines and composite materials. Sure, maybe this type of design was inevitable, but Airbus was indeed the first to do it. While not quite as advanced as the A320 family's fly-by-wire systems, the A300 was an early innovator in this department and helped inspire Airbus's development of the game-changing systems on the A320 in the late 1980s. It also pioneered the use of two crew cockpits for a wide body by eliminating the need for a flight engineer, something that would be adopted by the rest of the industry soon after. So, what do you think of the A300? Have you ever flown this old Airbus aircraft type? Let us know by leaving a comment. In addition to our daily YouTube videos, Simple Flying publishes over 150 articles and a podcast every week. Visit simpleflying.com.